My name is Jason Rickman. I'm with the Canadian Automatic Sprinkler Association and my role with the uh, association is the National Codes and Standards Manager. This is my first time here at this show. Uh, so far I'm, I'm loving it. Uh, people are great. Hopefully you can uh, get some really good information from, uh, from this presentation, which is why risk liability, how to inspect, test, and maintain your fire sprinkler system. So before I begin uh, as well, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the uh, fire codes, uh, the national fire code, and also the Ontario, Ontario fire code. Um, basically some uh, reference in regards to those, those codes. So with the national fire code, uh, which is used pretty much throughout all of Canada, um, it is a, basically a code that uh, references uh, NFPA 25 as the sole uh, standard to use whenever you inspect, test, and maintain a system. So in 6411, it basically states that a water-based fire protection system shall be inspected, tested, and maintained as per NFP 25, which is the Inspection, Testing, and Maintenance uh, Standard, which uh, is, again, referenced in the National Fire Code. So throughout Canada, ultimately you use uh, NFP 25. Now, whenever you use the Ontario Fire Code, Ontario Fire Code's a little different. So the Ontario Fire Code, it basically states that uh, the compliance with the inspection, testing, and maintenance provisions of NFPA 25, which is a standard for inspection, testing, and maintenance of water-based fire protection systems, for sprinkler systems is deemed to satisfy requirements in uh, section 654 to 656. So the Ontario Fire Code gives you an option. So it gives you an option of either using the fire code throughout or using the NFPA 25 document for section 654 to 656 only. So the rest of those sections that is used in the fire code still has to be used. So I just repeat myself again. So NFPA 25 can only be used for section 654 to 656 and in everything else, you still have to use the fire code for everything else. So 6512, sprinkler system shall be maintained in operating condition. Okay? And then the rest, you have the closing of sprinkler control valves, uh, changes of equipment and occupancy, obstruction, testing, underground mains, records. And then you have your subsection 652, which is your sprinkler system shutdowns which would include a notification, the sprinkler control valves and water supplies, a schedule of temporary shutdowns, program repairs, additional protection during shutdowns, identification for closed valves. So all those have to be followed in the Ontario Fire Code, no ifs or buts. Also too, with the Ontario Fire Code, the subsection 653, which also stipulates checking which uh, is a requirement that you have to check your pipe hangers, pressure maintenance devices, which is on your dry systems, uh, your protection against freezing and sprinkler heads. All these are all in the fire code that you have to follow. And if you choose to do so, use the NFPA 25 document, which basically th that is what I'm really gonna be discussing about is the option of using NFPA 25. Um, and ultimately, this standard has been around since 1992. It's a compilation of the inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements from numerous types of installation standards. When I'm talking about installation standards, the most, one of the most ones that you probably already heard of is the NFP 13 document, which is a water-based fire protection system installation standard. So that's the NFP 13 document that can be used. One thing that you can't get confused with is, is the use whenever you are inspecting, testing, and maintenance using the installation standard as well as NFPA 25. The only time that you use the installation standard is whenever you have any renovations, additions, or if you have any deficiencies that has to be repaired uh, for some reason that ultimately that would fall under the installation uh, standard and not the NFPA 25 standard, which is the inspe inspection, testing and maintenance uh, document, which is NFPA 25. <laughs> Again, this document was actually, if you remember way back when, the NFPA th uh, 
NFPA used to have a document that was an extension to NFPA 13A and NFPA 14A, uh, which was a recommended uh, practice for inspection, testing, and maintenance of systems back in the day, which basically were practices that was actually developed in New Zealand and Australia. So with the NFPA 25 document, and by the way, um, with CASA, CASA members, that's all we do is use the NFPA 25 document just to make everyone aware of that. Um, basically, there's, there's, with any standard, there's the scope purpose uh, that is very important information that you have to understand whenever you're looking at uh, NFPA standard. So the scope of NFPA 25 covers the administrative requirements uh, for the periodic inspection, testing, and maintain maintenance of water-based fire protection systems. In addition to the scope and purpose of the standard, Chapter 1, which you will find, provides guidance throughout the document. You have to note as well that the most po important point when using NFPA 25 is that the purpose of the standard is to verify operational um, status of the system. We can care less, obviously, you, you obviously care, but about the design and installation part of your system. But whenever you're using this inspection, testing, and maintenance document, it is the whole basis of that document is to make sure that your system is operational, period. Now, that doesn't say that um, someone, uh, an inspector, finds any design or installation deficiencies. If they do find any design or installation deficiencies, they can record that to the owner, but it would be as a separate document, not on the inspection form. So it'd be it's basically like a, uh, an informational uh, type of uh, document for information, just telling the, uh, the owner or owner's representative that you do have design and installation deficiencies that you need to take care of. Now, the authority to make sure that all this is, is intact and you're following uh, your inspection, testing, and maintenance program, and also design and installation uh, deficiencies, ultimately that falls under the shoulders of the uh, fire service, who is maintaining the authority having jurisdiction, which is maintaining the uh, fire code. So ultimately that is the people that make sure that ultimately everything is in check and operational and all the design and installation deficiencies are taken care of. Just to continue on with the scope, um, also uh, the, the NFPA 25 document uh, does not pertain to NFPA 13D systems. So that's another installation standard that we call 13 dwelling which is one to two family dwellings and manufactured homes. Those types of buildings do not fall under the scope of NFPA 25. Okay, it's just to make that clear. So one to two family dwellings and manufactured homes do not fall under the scope of NFPA 25. Also too, uh, I'll keep on reminding everyone that this document is basically it provides a reasonable degree of protection through minimum, I repeat, minimum inspection, testing, and maintenance. So another thing with, with NFPA 25 is, is words. And you have to understand the words of the document. If anyone has been in court in regards to uh, the use of NFPA 25, uh, it is a run of words when it comes to, to the court of law. So you really have to know exactly what those definitions are within the document. And where you find that is in chapter three of any NFPA document. So ultimately, make sure you fully understand the main key definitions. And also I underline reasonable because reasonable is a very interesting word especially because it's not in the NFPA document. It's not in any NFPA document. So what do you do if a, if a word is not in, in the NFPA document? Anyone know? Ultimately, there's references. If you look in your building code, fire code, there's references of, of definitions and stuff like that. 
and references of documents. The standard has the same type of thing of references. So if you look in any NFPA for definitions, you look in chapter three. So chapter three in any NFPA document gives you definitions of words. And if it's not in there, you, you basically look at the reference, which it references the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary 11th edition, which it is an American definition, uh, dictionary. So when you're looking at those definitions, it's going to be an American defined word. You have to follow that, that uh, description. So I looked it up basically in the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary in the 11th edition. And when you look at the uh, purpose is to provide reasonable degree of protection through ITM, you look at reasonable, it basically says that it's fair, sensible, fairly or moderately good. And the very last thing that everyone always, it's always about money, right? It is, says it's not too expensive, okay? That's what reasonable means in the Merriam-Webster's dictionary. So whenever you're looking at the NFPA 25 document or any NFPA document that is, reasonable is fair and sensible, fairly or moderately good and not too expensive. Also too, with, with the NFPA 25 document when you're using it, you can use a, a different type of ITM program. But if you do so, you have to provide an equivalent level of performance that has to be approved by the authority having jurisdiction, which is usually the fire service. So if you choose to go outside the box of NFPA 25, you can create your own ITM program, but it has to be equivalent level of performance and approved by the authority having jurisdiction. Also, what's not in the standard? So it is important to note that the scope of the inspection and testing is not for the technician to provide engineering judgment as to the system's design, only to determine that the system is functioning. It is similarly is not the job of the technician whoever is inspecting to determine if the hazard classification within the building is within the design parameters of the system. That requires a judgment that is left up to the engineer or the authority having jurisdiction, okay? The inspection, testing, and maintenance does not certify systems designs, okay? So whenever you hear the word, can you certify my system, there's no, you can't certify the system. All you can do is, is just to make sure that the system is operational, okay? I just wanted to clarify that make sure everyone's clear with that. And it's to a process to determine that system is functioning. Uh, in order to manage the cost of inspection while providing a reasonable degree of protection, NFPA 25 assumes that if no changes were made to the building or the hazard and the original installation was accepted by the applicable authority having jurisdiction, then it would still be considered acceptable, okay? So if you have any change of uses, you, you will get yourself into trouble if you do not report those changes of use. So it's, it's basically against the fire code and against the NFPA 25 document. So when you do have a change of use, please speak up and, and do the, the proper channels that you have to follow to make sure that uh, you have a proper uh, occupancy. Here are some of the key definitions. Uh, inspection, testing, maintenance, inspection, testing, maintenance service, qualified, what does qualified mean? Deficiencies, which could include a critical deficiency or non-critical deficiency or impairments, which can be basically an emergency situation, which you have a fire or a pre-planning, um, um, sorry, impairment where ultimately you have a deficiency design installation issue whatsoever that you have to work on the system for some apparent reason which puts that system uh, basically impaired. So inspection. A lot of people get things kind of uh, confused whenever you're looking at inspection, testing and maintenance. Sometimes people confuse things with testing, with inspections, Inspections with testing, maintenance with testing, 
ultimately, you, that's why you really need to know these definitions. Uh, basically, an inspection is basically a visual an examination of the system or portion thereof to verify that it appears to be in operating condition and is free of physical damage. That's what inspection means in the NFPA 25 document. Now, a question is, okay, so what if I have an issue that's 45 feet in the air? Do you need to use a lift to look and see what's going on up there? No. Ultimately, there's no requirement or special needs of tools to actually uh, go up there and see what's going on. It's just a visual inspection from the floor. Now, that doesn't say that someone can go ahead and bring in some ideas such as bring in binoculars. You can do that if you want, but there's nothing in the standard that stipulates that you have to bring special tools to do a visual inspection and examination. Testing. <laughs> this poor guy, middle of winter. It's a fine example of, of whenever you're doing your tests, you have to make sure you do it in the warmer months, especially being here in Canada. <laughs> we had a nasty winter this year. So whenever this per gentleman is actually doing what we call a fire pump test, so he has some flow meters on the test header, and basically he's doing his test. So we, again, fine example of doing your testing in the summer months. So testing is basically a, a procedure to determine that there is operational status of the component or the system by conducting periodic physical checks such as water flow tests, fire pump tests, alarm tests, uh, trip tests on dry systems, deluge systems, or pre-action valves, so on and so forth. The test is, is a follow-up of the original acceptance test at intervals that is special, specified in appropriate chapters within the NFPA 25 document. Maintenance. Another fine example of, of maintaining your outside of your building, you ultimately when you have fire protection uh, devices such as this uh, standing uh, post indicating valve, it's basically where maintenance is, a, what is for work performed to keep the equipment operable or to make repairs. Maintenance includes not only the required functions in, in, in the standard, but also practices and procedures recommended by the manufacturer, whoever that is. Maintenance is not always directly related to physical components of the system. It also includes a day-to-day -day operations necessary to ensure that the system is accessible. So one of the biggest things is your fire hydrants. Make, make, think, make sure that snow is out of the way. Brush. Uh, uh, brush or, or any plant life or whatever that's in front of it. Make sure everything's clear so ultimately you have the means to, to operate whatever that is, especially in FDC. Fire department connection, fire service needs to connect into those things. Also another thing when you talk about definitions is qualify. Very uh, interesting um, um, requirement obviously is because the standard basically states that it is a competent and capable person or company so it's not just the person is, uh, doing the inspection and testing and maintenance but it's also the company okay the company that it has to meet the the, uh, the requirements and training for a given uh, field acceptable to the authority having jurisdiction so NFP 25 does not require licensing of individuals or companies. It leaves it up to the authority having jurisdiction. Or in our case, the province. Okay, so our province in Ontario, there is a requirement of licensing. If you haven't heard that ultimately any person inspecting or actually test, mainly testing and maintaining a system has to be uh, uh, basically licensed through the Ontario College of Trades, which recognizes sprinkler protection installers as being a compulsory trade. It's the same as being a plumber or electrician. 
and that came into effect February 2nd of 2017. There's no requirement, however, for a contractor. Obviously, being biased, being CASA, obviously prefer to have a CASA member doing your inspection, testing, and maintenance. So ultimately, just to make sure you're aware of that. So whoever's, you can check basically the status of that particular uh, person uh, by going on the Ontario College of Trades website and you can actually look up that person's name online or you can even ask them on site to show their card. All of them shall have cards. Even the, the apprentices shall have a OCOT uh, card with them. Another thing is impairments. Impairments is a condition where a fire protection system or unit or portion thereof is out of service or order and the condition can result in a fire protection system or unit not functioning in a fire event. This is the most extreme issue that you can have on your water-based fire protection system. In some jurisdictions, uh, ultimately require a 24-hour fix. So if you have an impairment on your, in your building, it has to be fixed within 24 hours. So this is a really big issue. If your system is impaired, you got to get your system fixed because heaven forbid a fire occurs in your building and your system is impaired, you're going to have to go in front of a judge and explain to that judge why your system is not up and running. And I don't know about you, but I've been in court before. It's not fun. Okay, so ultimately make sure your system is not impaired. And that picture basically shows you an impairment just by looking, doing a visual examination, doing an inspection, which anyone can do if, if you have some, a little bit of knowledge of the system. It says shut. If you see any valves that say shut, you better ask some questions on why that valve is shut because ultimately your system is probably impaired. So make sure that system is up and running. With the impairments, there's two different types. As I mentioned, there's pre-plan and emergency. So pre-plan is basically in condition where the water-based fire protection system or portion thereof is out of service due to work, okay? And ultimately, this has to be planned in advance, such as any revisions to the water supply or sprinkler system uh, piping needs to be um, aware of. Also, any system impairment can also lead to danger, other dangers as mentioned. Also, the emergency impairment is like it says. It's an emergency. Something happens to your system. You have an activated sprinkler for some reason. That is an emergency impairment, and ultimately, you need to call 911. So if you have an emergency impairment, you need to call 911. No ifs or buts about it. The fire service needs to be aware of that to make sure, if, because ultimately, there's something going on that the sprinkler system has been activated. Deficiencies, so deficiencies, as mentioned, there's critical and non-critical deficiencies. It's basically a condition of which the system or portion thereof is damaged for, for some reason. It's inoperable or in need of service, okay? But it does not rise to the level of what we call impairment. So critical deficiency is basically, if not corrected, it can have an effect of the performance of the water-based fire protection system. And a non-critical deficiency, it does not have an effect on the performance of the fire protection system, but correction is needed for proper inspection, testing, and maintenance of the system. So an example of, of a, a non-critical deficiency would be you're missing sprinkler heads in the head cabinet. You're missing uh, signage on your control valves. Those are examples of critical deficiencies. An example, or non-critical, I should say. Non-critical deficiencies would be that. Critical deficiencies, would, an example would be you have paint on the frame arms of the sprinkler head. Now, if you have paint on the element, that would actually be an impairment. So there's two different degrees there. So with these deficiencies and impairments, you've got to kind of understand the differences between all of them. 
And what's good with the NFP25 document, it actually, uh, it, there's actually a table that gives you some of the examples of what's a critical deficiency, non-critical deficiency, what's an impairment, so on and so forth, which we'll get into uh, a little later. So with the inspection, testing, and maintenance, uh, the owners or designated representative, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is responsible for a properly maintained based water-based fire protection system. If you take care of your cars, it's the same thing as taking care of your water-based fire protection systems. It should be twofold because it is a life safety system. You, you got to take care of this stuff. So ultimately, you, owners or owner's representatives are, uh, or designated representatives are responsible for that. With that in mind as well, whenever you have dealing with NFPA 25 versus the inspection, testing, and maintenance contract, those two have to marry each other. You can't just go ahead and use a different inspection uh, form for what you are contracted to do. Ultimately, this, the inspection should relate to your contract. So ultimately, a contract can be anything that the owner can give you. The owner can say, okay, I just want you to check my dry system, which they have the prerogative. They can do that if they want. They want to check their dry systems. Okay, make sure that that inspection reflects that contract that you only do dry system, the dry sprinkler systems on that water-based fire protection system. One of the main uh, contracts that you'll see obviously out there is one year annuals. So annuals, if you do an annual, you have to follow everything for your annual inspections. Has to lie, marry with the, with the contract, with the inspection forms. Also impairments, uh, where impairment is water-based fire protection system occurs, the procedures is outlined actually in chapter 15 of NFPA 25 and shall be followed including the attachment of a tag to the impaired system. So whenever your system is impaired, there has to be a tag at the sprinkler valve and at the FDC stating that it's impaired and all those directives is in chapter 15. And there's what chapter four says, 419, which tells you follow the procedures that's outlined in chapter 15. Maintenance. Maintenance, again, shall be performed to keep the system equipment operable or to make repairs. This is an example of a drip, tra a drip tray for a fire pump. So if you look at a fire pump, you don't see little drips going in that in front of the pump. I guarantee you probably have a fire pump issue because the glands within the fire pump probably seized and you're probably not going to start your fire pump system. So you have to see one, uh, usually it's one drip per second. It could be quicker. As long as there's some sort of water going into that water tray uh, for the fire pump, that's the main thing. And that's part of a maintenance type of procedure. So now we're moving on to the different types of tables. So the use of tables for inspection, testing, and maintenance schedules. So all I can stress is that the most important use of the tables is to basically give you a quick, and quick uh, reference uh, of the section that tells you when things have to be performed. It is an easy method of finding the appropriate rule addressing that particular issue. We should stress, however, that the tables should be used only as a reference and not as a definitive rule, okay? You gotta look in the body of the standard. In many cases, the tables are not all inclusive of every circumstance. For example, table 5112 for sprinkler systems says nothing about sprinkler manufacturers or sprinklers that have been manufactured prior to 1920. But we would find that the rule among the other reference sections from the table as well. So it's just a quick guide. So table 5112, a summary of sprinkler system inspection, testing, and maintenance, gives you some of the items that you would find on a water-based fire protection system. And it'll tell you the different frequencies of what you have, basically the frequency of the specific item. So if you, for instance, you have sprinklers that are dry sprinklers, you have to make sure 
that at 10 years and every 10 years thereafter, they have to be tested at the ULC lab. So Underwriters Laboratories of Canada. You have to ship those sprinklers, a, a, a sample amount, uh, to the um, ULC, which the reference would be 53116. Also gauges. If you have gauges on your system, they have to be uh, either tested or replaced every five years. So guess what? Most water air gauges, it's cheaper just to go ahead and buy a new gauge instead of trying to get them all calibrated and stuff. And that's 532. So this basically tells you table 5112, uh, basically the uh, summary of your sprinkler system on when you have to do something. And then here's what it actually looks like in the actual standard, some more examples of the frequencies. So it gives you weeklies, monthlies, quarterlies, monthlies, <coughs> annuallys, and then even every five years, an obstruction internal inspection of the piping has to be done every five years if using NFPA 25. That's per 14.2. Here's another table, a table used in Annex E, a table to determine whether issues are within the scope of NFPA 25. So whenever we're talking about different types of things out there, is it really within the scope? So when you look at that, uh, the examples of classification that needs and, uh, correction and repairs, it gives you some of your fighting, findings that you would find on your water-based fire protection system, dependent on the item. It gives you the examples, is it an impairment? Is it a deficiency? or critical deficiency or non-critical deficiency. So the very first one, if you look, sprinklers. Is it leaking? Is it heavily corroded? Is, the, is, there painted, is there paint on the operating element, which is the glass bulb or solder uh, element? Uh, or the deflector or cover plate heavily loaded? Form materials attached to or suspended from improper orientation, because each sprinkler has an orientation specification. It's either upright, pendant, which is down, or sidewall, which is on the side of the wall. The orientation has to be correct. So ultimately, if you see any of that, and I bet you you're asking the question, what is heavily loaded meaning? Heavily loaded is basically when you see a ton of dust particles on the sprinkler head. I'm sure you've seen it before. It's nasty stuff. There's ways to clean that, uh, preferably with uh, compressed air in a far distance so you don't disrupt the element. But that would be an example of an impairment. And that's where this becomes very subjective and their judgment call has to be made on from the uh, inspector. But this is a, these are really good tables that's found um, in the NFP 25 document to give you just a recognition of the differences of things that you would see out there that may or may not need your attention to make sure it's fixed. Another thing that uh, is uh, interesting uh, as well uh, that's in the Ontario Fire Code actually in regards to obstructions, uh, 6515, it's, it stipulates that no obstruction shall be placed so as to interfere with the effectiveness of water discharge from the sprinkler. It also states that sprinkler systems shall not be used to support anything that will interfere with effective sprinkler system performance. So that's, the, that's going outside the scope of NFPA 25 because NFPA 25, remember, we assume that the design and installation is done correctly. Uh, and this ultimately becomes kind of uh, fire codes telling you you have to do it. So it's very interesting. I just want to bring that up. Also, uh, another table to be uh, uh, active in understanding is the use of component replacement action replacement tables uh, to determine what test inspections are required to restore the system back to service. So you have your system down for some reason. Well, now there's a procedure in place that you have to follow in regards to what actions that need to be taken care of. 
So here's the, basically what it says in Table 651, uh, Summary of Component Replacement Action Requirements. It gives you if it has to, the component needs to be adjusted, repaired, or replaced after when your system goes back into service again. So just another good uh, table to look at in the NFPA 25 document. Another thing that's good whenever you use the tables is making sure that you use the proper table for the specific question that you have. So well, you got to ask yourself, what questions are we asking? If you're asking how often are we required to do something, you look in the inspection, testing, and maintenance tables. Is the circumstances we have encountered within the scope of NFPA 25, are we actually talking about NFPA 25 or another standard? You look in table E1 in Annex E, e for, for that information. And then what actions are required in order to restore a system back in the service, which we just looked at, which is the component replacement action table that you would look at. So we're moving on. Now we're moving on to the confusion of, there used to be confusion back in, uh, before the uh, 2011 uh, NFPA 25 document in regards to internal piping inspections versus obstruction investigations. Those are two separate things. So the internal piping inspection can be found in chapter 14. It basically ensures continued operability of the water-based fire protection system by addressing the interior condition of the piping system. Metal piping systems can lose structural integrity Obviously, air and water don't mix very well, right? So ultimately, uh, the corrosion factor can potentially become an obstruction due to the corrosion byproducts, such as pipe scaling, we call it. Um, the periodic internal inspections of pipe systems are intended to address this issue, okay? Piping obstructing material. Sprinkler systems are no exceptions. Any maintenance program must include means for revealing potential obstructions and removing any obstructions that exist. Obstructions are addressed in Chapter 14, which identifies potential causes of piping obstructions and by requiring an obstruction investigation, which is different from an internal piping inspection, which we'll get to in a little later, and any of those situations exist. So one of the unique things in the Ontario Fire Code that's different to NFPA 25 is on dry systems. In dry systems in the Ontario Fire Code, the, this requirement of doing an internal inspection or internal, yeah, internal inspection, piping inspection is every 15 years. In NFPA 25, it's every five years. So that's a major difference in, in, in differences there. And as an owner, obviously, I, if I have corrosion going on my, in my system, I got to get that taken care of because guess what? If you don't and leave it, you're going to have to replace the whole system, which will cost a hell of a lot more of replacing the whole system versus just fixing sections, little sections of pipe, wherever that is. So just, in, just a FYI. And there's uh, basically some uh, general information on Chapter 14. As I mentioned, it's required every five years by removing, uh, the, the, the way you do an internal inspection is by removing a sprinkler near the end of the branch line by opening a flushing connection at the end of the main. Exceptions for non-metallic pipe. So if you have non-metallic pipe, uh, dry and pre-action systems, a lack of flex, flex, uh, uh, flushing connections would be an exception. And uh, also, uh, whenever you have multiple wet systems, the standard actually allows you to do every other one if you have multiple wet systems. So you don't have to do an inspection, on internal inspection on each and every wet system every five years. What you can do, you can do uh, one after the other. Now, if you do find obstructions within the wet system that you are inspecting, then you have to do all of them. So there is some good, uh, some good uh, things in regards to some exceptions to the rule in NFPA 25, which can help you in that aspect. Um, also, here's just a picture of, of what you can find within your pipe. That's pipe scaling. That is basically uh, non-destructive 
or a, a pipe scale that, that can be found in there. It could be significant. I would consider that significant. Um, also with that as well, to do your internal inspection, you can also use non-destructive type of methods. So you can use uh, different types of scans and stuff like that to actually go through the pipe and in do your inspection that way. So there are other means that the uh, standard can, does allow you to, to use other different stuff to actually inspect that uh, piping to make sure it's not obstructed. So that's an internal inspection type of requirement in Chapter 14. Now we're moving on to an obstruction investigation, which basically can be spurred from the internal inspection. So this was a, a major clarification in the 2011 edition. There's a distinct difference between internal inspection and obstruction investigation. While internal inspections is a timely base, as we mentioned, every five years, there is no time requirement for an obstruction investigation. They are solely based on what we call triggers. And this was very confusing in the editions prior to the 2011 edition of NFPA 25. So some of those triggers include the following. There's a total of 14 different triggers, okay? You have uh, defective fire pump intake, fire pump taking uh, suction from open body of water would be a trigger to have an obstruction investigation. Discharge obstructive material during routine water tests. Foreign material in fire pumps, dry valves, or in check valves. Foreign material in water during drain tests or plugging of, test, of uh, inspectors' test connections. Plug sprinklers. Plug piping found in systems dismantled during building alterations. So if you see stuff like that during building alterations, that can trigger an obstruction investigation. Failure to, to flush yard piping in public mains. A record, if you have a record of broken mains within the vicinity of your building, that would be an obstruction investigation. Abnormally false trip tests. So obviously the dry system, if you have multiple trip tests for no apparent reason, that is a means of doing an obstruction investigation. Uh, system return to service after an extended shutdown that is greater than one year. You have to do an obstruction investigation. Reason to believe a system contains sodium silicate or highly corrosive fluxes uh, in copper piping systems. Supplied, uh, a system supplied with raw water via the fire department connection. Pinhole leaks. Also too, one of the key things if you have a dry system um, and you have a 50% increase in travel time or delivery time from your acceptance test of your dry system, and it's 50% more time to get from the valve to your most remote uh, outlet, that would be a means of obstruction investigation. That means something's going on in your dry system that obst that's obstructing the air to get out of the system to get water to, to the system. So to do an obstruction investigation, you have to do the following. You have to basically, it requires an internal inspection of piping at four different points. At the sprinkler valve, at the riser, at a cross main, and branch line. And if you don't know the difference of, the, of what a cross main is, a cross main is basically where you have two mains that crosses each other, like it says. A branch line is basically, it comes off of a smaller pipe that comes off the mains, which is the bigger part of the system, it's the bigger pipe, which I call that, I always call, I always go by human anatomy whenever I'm talking about a system. Your water supplies your heart, your main is your artery, and your branch lines are kind of your little, your little veins. So I always try to give an analogy on that. So that, that's the difference between that. So system valve, riser, cross main, and branch line those are the four internal inspection points that you have to do whenever you're doing an obstruction investigation. So impairments. Some things in regards to impairments that I want to give you more information in regards to impairments is you have to have responsible people and respons a responsible or responsibility uh, whenever you do have an impairment. 
So with that, you have to have these items in place. You have to have what we call an impairment coordinator, which we'll get into a little later, which by the way, the owner has to have a person at that building that is specified or has to be the impairment coordinator. It could be the building maintenance person, whoever that is, they have to take control of your water-based fire protection system. You have to have a tag impairment system in place. You have to uh, figure out your impaired equipment, what they are, pre-planned impairment, know the difference between pre-planned impairments, emergency impairments, and restoring the system back into service. So a formal impairment program establishes procedures for maintaining the system control valves in the correct position. Furthermore, implementation of an organized impairment program can also minimize the length of time that a system is out of service. This chapter, the chapter 15, provides the basic requirements for such an impairment program. The success of any impairment program is determined by the support it receives from those responsible in, that's implementing it. Okay, often the best way to ensure that an impairment program is properly uh, set up in, to review, it, it's basically to review it with the authority having jurisdiction, which can be the fire department, the insurance company, or other officials. If any situations arise that are not covered by the impairment program, it is good practice to seek advice from the authority having jurisdiction, okay? So the impairment coordinator, it's actually in the standard 15.2. It says the property owner or designated representative shall assign an impairment coordinator to comply with the requirements of this chapter. In the absence of that, if there isn't any, the owner or owner's representative has to take that place. And that's in the standard when using the NFPA 25 document. It's basically management 101. Also, the duration of the system impairment. So the standard talks about, uh, that, about the, the requirements. Also, the fire code does as well. But when talking about the standard, Anything greater than 10, 10 hours in a, a 24-hour period, you have to select one of the following options. So you either evacuate your building, you establish an approved fire watch by the authority having jurisdiction, you establish a temporary water supply, or you eliminate potential ignition sources and fuel sources. Those are your options. Some administrative issues that come about. One of the things that everyone needs to come to together with, all stakeholders, when dealing with the inspection, testing, and maintenance, is communication, okay? The owner may not know what the, ins the inspector's telling you, right? The inspector, most of the times, is an ex-installer in uh, or has the uh, water-based fire protection system type of lingo, which the owner may or may not understand what they're talking about. So it's key to have some good communication and the contractor having the proper wording to use to the owner so the owner understands what the installer is saying and also the owner kind of knowing their system a little bit better as well so they understand a little bit better. It's all about communication. It's all about information okay with that information it's fact okay that information is site specific so there's two different things that site specific that references the nfpa 25 in your inspector um, forms or it's outside the scope of nfpa 25 which would be basically an informational only report which is basically a report that stipulates that you have design or installation issues on your system. So the top site specific is you have operational problems and at the bottom you have either design or installation problems. That is all given to the owner and that owner or owner's representative has to keep those records and in NFPA 25 those records is three records. The record for acceptance, the record previous 
that was the previous record and the current record needs to be uh, maintained and, uh, and, and basically the owner shall have that. With that in mind, that is the property of the owner. So the owner ultimately does not give that to anyone unless specifically asked by the authority having jurisdiction, okay? Because that is the property of the owner or owner's representative. They, that's, their, that's their property, okay? So you, can, you only have to provide that information when the authority having jurisdiction asks for that information. So here's just some of the questions that might be asked that I just came about, gave some questions that you may have. So fire sprinkler, I have a sprinkler with, with uh, sound caulking on it around the recessed discussion, paint on the arms and deflector. Is this covered by NFPA 25? Everyone should be shaking, yes, it is. 52111, it's considered a critical deficiency because ultimately there is paint on the deflector and also on the element itself. So that would be considered, or sorry, the, the paint on the frame arm would be considered a, a, a critical deficiency and paint on the, def, on the basically the, uh, uh, the element, the bulb deflector would be considered an impairment, okay? So you have two, two problems there. You have critical deficiency and an impairment. So guess what? You gotta fix it. No ifs or buts about it. Something I see all the time in buildings. People, obviously owners try to maintain and try to use as much space as possible in their buildings, right? And sometimes you guys go a little above and beyond what you should be going whenever it comes to storage. So how close can I be for my storage to my sprinkler head? The answer to your question is 18 inches. You have to maintain a minimum of 18 inches for any sprinkler head. Now, there are some exceptions where it has to be more than that. So if you have tire storage, it has to be 36 inches. If you have special sprinklers, such as ESFRs, CMSAs, ESFRs is early suppression fast response, CMSAs is control mode specific application, which those are storage type of sprinkler heads, you need 36 inches, not 18 inches. And the reason for that is the development of the sprinkler stream. So the, the, the stream itself, it needs that, uh, that uh, space for a proper uh, sprinkler spray. Also too, any uh, secured type of uh, obstruction that is wider than four feet, in the ins basically would also need a sprinkler head underneath it. Um, and that's basically for any installation type of, uh, that should be under there during installation. Now we come to records. Records. This is where the owner or owner's representative really needs to pay attention to because this can cost you a lot of money, guys, a lot of money. So this becomes very difficult and potentially very expensive problem. The standard simply requires that records be maintained according to section 4.3. It does not address the lack of records. Therefore, if the owner has no records, then they must be replaced or re recre uh, recreated. A complete inspection, testing, and maintenance program will have to be performed in order to establish baseline records for comparison. If the owner has none of the original records, um, basically they have to reproduce it, okay? And to do that, you have to basically get an engineer to recreate everything. So it becomes very cumbersome and uh, ultimately you have to have those records in place. If it is a hydro, especially if it's a hydraulically designed system, then the requirement for a riser tag is provided in section 526. So if you're missing that, how do you supposed to know? The owner is required to provide that information. Remember that we are operating under the assumption that the system was installed and accepted as correct. It is the owner's responsibility to verify compliance of NFPA 25. 
The standard does not address the situation where a hydraulic tag is required. Common sense would tell us that is not required if the system was not hydraulically designed. However, we are simply to verify that the presence of the tag, it is not required, it is the owner's responsibility to provide that information. And here's a fire, a fire pump performance criteria. What is the acceptable performance level for a fire pump? According to section 835, a pump is considered acceptable if it is not degraded more than 5% in pressure at rated flow. So at 100% flow, it cannot be more than 5%. The pressure cannot be less than 5% during the original acceptance curve or from the data plate itself. For electric motors, must have also have a voltage reading either within 5 below or 5% below or 10% above the rated voltage on the nameplate of the motor. So if you have those issues, there's something going on and you have to fix your fire pump. So because of time, I'm kind of limited on, I also include some other questions that may be asked. So who is responsible for checking, inspecting, testing, and maintaining a sprinkler system? The owner, right? The owner is fully responsible to make sure, or owner's representative is to make sure that system's running or operational. How long, do, how long before I have to replace the sprinkler system? I get questions all the time. How long does the sprinkler system last? The sprinkler system can last as long as you maintain, inspect, and test the system. There's no expiry date on sprinkler systems. It can last forever. As long as you inspect, test, and maintain it, it will last. It will last for a long time. Um, some other things. Uh, so when, when replacing sprinklers on a system, is it necessary to perform a hydrostatic test? The answer is yes. Uh, if basically you do have to replace uh, sprinklers on your system, if there's more than 20 sprinklers, you have to do a hydrostatic test. It's in the, uh, it's actually, that would be in the installation standard since you're taking out the sprinkler head and reinstalling it, then it goes into the installation standard which stipulates that if there's more than 20 sprinkler heads being replaced, you have to hydrostatic test it. Also too, with that in mind, if you do um, replace the sprinkler, it has to be a new sprinkler. You can't go ahead and reuse sprinklers. So because of time, I'm limited. Is there any questions? Yes. Is this uh, presentation available? Yes, this, uh, I can provide this, uh, this uh, presentation um, to whoever that is. Uh, also, too, you can actually see the recording on uh, buildingscanada.com as well. Also, if you have any further questions on sprinkler systems, I'm in the exhibit hall in booth 124. So if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to come to see me. And I have my card here too, if you want some of my cards as well. Thank you so much for your attention and have a good day. Thank you guys. Thank you.